The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Open your Bibles to Romans 8. We'll read verses 18 through 30. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have uh, been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for if we do not know how to, we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together or that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Thus, the reading of God's word may be seated. <coughs> a few weeks ago, I was watching um, a college basketball game, and the sportscaster was talking about a a particularly gifted young player who played way above his age with maturity. And so they explained how his father had reared him. His father was the basketball coach in the high school. He saw the potential in his son, so he kept him on a very rigorous schedule, such as getting him up at 3 o'clock in the morning at times to do a workout before he went to school and then have to work out with the team that afternoon. Now, I'm sure that that young man did not enjoy getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and doing a hard workout. I'm sure the extra pressure of balancing that, a lack of sleep with his studies, um, but he, he would endure, he would persevere because he knew two things. He knew his father loved him. He knew his father had a purpose for him. Now, that really ties into what Paul's doing here in, in Romans chapter 8, particularly in this last part. We looked two weeks ago at verse 28 that all things are working together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. But what Paul's doing there is simply continuing to flesh out the theme they introduced in the end of verse 17. And that although we are heirs with Christ, that means that we are going to suffer with Christ, that we might enter into our glory in the same way that he entered into his glory. So beginning then with verse 18, the apostle is dealing now with the trials of the heir. The trials of the heir. How is, how is God preparing his heir? Well, it's not dissimilar from how... Uh, a very wealthy man uh, would prepare his son to take over the business. If he's a smart man, he won't put him into places of leadership. He finishes a, a father-designed university program, and he goes to the mailroom. Then perhaps the maintenance department. 
There may be a salesman out on the road or uh, lower level management. And you know the heir did not appreciate all of those various things, but he was training him for the inheritance. And that's what Paul's showing us here. And so first he says, look on the final inheritance. And he directs our attention that there is a greater glory. He illustrated that from the creation. Itself is, is manifesting to us that there's something beyond this, something that in some way the creation is groaning for. Then he points to us that we ourselves, with this sense of our adoption, know there's something more coming, there's something better. It's the basis of that that he will say that in comparison to that, our trials here are momentary light afflictions. But we have hope, which is the certainty that comes from faith in God. He's our Father, and He has a purpose. Now, He turns His attention back to the Holy Spirit, and He's telling us that as we are in these trials, and I didn't probably link this as much as I've seen it in subsequent meditation, it is in our trials that the Spirit is particularly interceding for us, that we would profit from them, and that, yes, we would know how to pray, but also that the Father would work in us through those trials, what he has designed for us. Now, it's in that background that he comes to this glorious statement in chapter 8, verse 28, about knowing that all things work together, or are working together for us, um, loved of God, who love God, and who are the called according to his purpose. The Father loves us. He's the Father who has adopted us. And the Father has a purpose for us, and that's the foundation, then, of how we can look at our trials, yes, even at our sins. So now we hear, well, what is this glorious purpose, then? What is this all about? What is the reality of this inheritance? And this is what Paul fleshes out now in our text today, verses 29 and 30. You'll notice that 29 begins with a little word for. He's going to explain now, what is this purpose? What is this calling according to a purpose? And that's what Paul is showing us in verses 29 and 30. That God has eternally purposed to conform us perfectly to the image of His Son through His work of redemption. That God has eternally purposed to conform us perfectly to the image of His Son through His work of redemption redemption. So I want to consider three, try to consider three things today uh, from these verses. The eternal purpose, the effectual procedure, and uh, the final product. So we begin uh, in verse 29 with the eternal purpose. So what is this purpose for which we've been called? It gives us the certainty that all things work together for good. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we might or that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. So here's, here's the purpose. And that is that God has foreknown us, predestined us to become conformed to his son, that the son then will be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, when we look at this verse, we will admit or say every true Christian believes in predestination. Now, well, are you saying then that Arminians, no? It depends how you define this first word. You have to believe if you're a Christian in predestination because the Bible's full of the term. And so it's this first word that's so important now in this discussion, those whom he foreknew he predestined. And the typical evangelical explanation of that is, is that God looked and surveyed mankind down through uh, the centuries from his perch in eternity. He saw who would make good use of grace and respond uh, to the gospel. And he ordered that they are the ones that would be saved. And that is the, pretty much the basic idea of foreknow, the verb, or foreknowledge, the noun. There's three things wrong with that interpretation. It is wrong grammatically, it is wrong linguistically, and it is wrong doctrinally. And what I mean is wrong grammatically. Well, just look at the verse. This is not that God looked on all mankind and saw something. No, 
The object of foreknowledge is the one who is predestined. Do you see that? The grammar is quite clear. The object of foreknowledge is the one who is predestined. So this is not some knowledge by which God would act, because it's not about all people. It's focused on the predestinated ones. Uh, linguistically, it doesn't work. Uh, yes, we could say that this word could be used to talk about knowing events ahead of time. But in God's case, why does God know events ahead of time? Well, there's two ways that we understand the verb foreknow or the noun foreknowledge. And the first is that God eternally, intuitively knew every possibility that could ever occur in the entire history of creation. And in that, he determined, this is what I will do for my own glory. So it's not that he saw you would do A, so all right, I'll choose A. No, he saw every possibility of what he would do and, and what he could do and what would happen. He said, this is the way I'm going to go. I'm going to do it this way because by this, will be in my great glory. So there we see that relationship of foreknowledge and predestination is the way that Paul uses it in Acts chapter, or Peter uses it in Acts chapter 2 in this first uh, post-Pentecost uh, recorded sermon, verses 22 and 23. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross. Now, if the Arminian interpretation of this word here, foreknowledge, was that God saw what would happen and then said, okay, that would mean that God saw they'd want to put his son to death and that he said, all right, I'll do it that way. But no, Christ has eternally been set forth as the savior of his people. And so foreknowledge here in the first place simply has to do, this is the way that God is going to act and thus God knew exactly what he would do according to his predetermination. But you also realize there's a more intimate meaning of the word know or foreknow, to know ahead of time. We see it, for example, in Psalm 1, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the wicked perish. What's the psalmist saying? God loves the way of the righteous. God approves of the way of the righteous. And so the word also then refers to an eternal approval and love. Now, we see this clearly when it's applied to our Savior in 1 Peter chapter 1, where Peter will write of Christ, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. What does that mean? That God had placed a special love on God the Son and prospect of the incarnation as the Redeemer. And from eternity, placed that love on Him. That in Him, He then places an eternal love on us. So you could actually interpret those whom He foreknew, He predestined, in the language of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, those whom He loved. He predestined. It's an eternal love, an amazing love that God placed on His Son to give us the Son that He might love us in the Son. And that's what it means. That's His purpose, that those whom He foreknew, He predestined. Now, predestined then is very simple. It means to foreordain. It's that God's foreordained all that comes to pass, but particularly when we apply it to uh, salvation, we think of it as God's election or God's choice, as Paul then spells that out in Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father uh, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus uh, in the heavenly, just as He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory 
of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. And so God eternally determined to put his love on us, choosing us then to be what? Now we get to the purpose. The foreknowledge and predestination are means unto the end. All of salvation is a means to an end. And here is the end encapsulated, that we might be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. As images of God, we fell in Adam. Um, we lost the moral uh, part of that image of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. The rest of it was greatly weakened and vitiated. The whole purpose of redemption is to bring us uh, back to uh, communion with God. But now we have the standard. Christ incarnate was the truly perfect image of God. Yes, obviously uh, in his divine nature, but in his human nature. The perfect image of God with perfect knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. He becomes then the template, uh, the goal, the pattern by which God is working in each of us to bring us back to this standard of sinless knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Not perfect knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. That belongs only to the Savior. But sinless knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And he does this that the Son might have this great reward. Now this takes us back to that remarkable language in verse 17 that we are heirs, yea, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Here's the elder brother. He is the heir and the guarantor of our inheritance. He has purchased it for us by his obedience hell satisfying death, burial, and resurrection. And he was raised from the dead that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And his reward is that he's going to have the brethren, the brothers and sisters, that will be part of his inheritance as he enables us to enter into his inheritance. And so you see that our salvation is all about God glorifying himself glorifying himself by having a people in whom our Savior will be so wonderfully exalted here now as we stumble along in our pilgrimage and perfectly in glory. So that's the eternal purpose. So now you know your Father loves you. He's adopted you. And now you see what he's all about in the trials of your life. You see how this begins to fit together because if we're going to be conformed to the image of our beloved Savior, there's a lot of transformation that needs to take place. And that transformation takes place through the renewal of our minds and through all the work of the Spirit in us. But one of God's primary tools for our transformation is suffering. That starts right there in verse 17. It is the appointed way to glory. And it causes us to long for our inheritance, as we've seen. But now we see, more particularly, it actually equips us for this eternal inheritance. Every difficulty, whether it's personal or financial or emotional or uh, illnesses, whatever, persecution, every difficulty is part of the Father's purpose. A Father who loves you so much that he did what he gave you his only son to be your Savior. A Father who loves you and has got a purpose for you. Much better than being a great high school basketball player. No. That you'll be conformed to the image of his son. Now you see as well how this applies even to our sin. I said two weeks ago, we don't sin deliberately, but God uses our sin in order as well to work to our good. In fact, our sin actually can be part of the means of our sanctification. Think about the way the standards put it in the chapter on Providence, chapter 5, paragraph 5. The most wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruption of their own hearts to chastise them for former sins 
or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption. Has that not been your experience? That you've fallen into some, maybe something you even thought you were exempt from, and what it was was simply a window on the corruption of your heart. Or to chasten them for former sins, or to discover to them the hidden strength of corruption. That we fear sin, we fear the flesh, we fear the devil, we flee then to Christ. Hidden strength of corruption, deceitfulness of their hearts that may be humbled. And to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself. And to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin and for sundry other just and holy ends. Here we see how God is causing our sins also to be part of our sanctification. Why they too are for our good as they're turned to our good by the Spirit of Christ in applying them to us for our sanctification. And so it's good for us in our struggles, in our sins as well, to be mindful that a loving Father has a big purpose, an eternal purpose. And this is what He is aggressively pursuing in our lives. So how does He pursue this eternal purpose to cause us to conform perfectly to uh, the image of His Son? To what I'm calling the... Uh, effective procedure. This is a way of talking about, it's a way of giving you three Ps so you can remember the sermon. So it's my way of talking though about the application of redemption. Now what we have in Romans 8.30 is what Perkins called the golden chain of salvation. That's become pretty much the popular way since then to speak of it. One pole is in eternity, past, if we can speak of eternity that way. Other pole is in our eternity that lies ahead of us. It's stretched out in this panoply that all those whom he predestinated, he did two things to in time, effectively, effectually. So those whom he predestinated, he called, and those whom he uh, called, he justified. So here... Paul puts the two, we could say, principal acts of application to us in the converting, transforming process of conforming us to the image of his son. So in the first place, we must be called, and I said this is the effectual procedure, this is the effectual call. It takes place in the context of a broader, more general call. Our Savior refers to that. Many are called, but few are chosen. It's only the elect that are going to be called effectively, but it is so effective that all who are called will be glorified. Isn't that what Jesus says in John 6, 44? That no man can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. I was having a discussion one time with a group of pastors, and this was the question I asked, what does the second half of that verse have to do with the first half? Everything. Everyone drawn by the Father is going to be glorified, which means this calling is an effectual calling, a sovereign calling. So as we read in Acts, the Lord opened Lydia's heart and she believed. Or in Pisidian Antioch, all those who were appointed to eternal life believed. So this is the, the glorious call of the Father by the Word, through the Spirit, but it's the Father who's calling us now to Himself to be his sons and daughters. The calling, coupled with it, regeneration, so that it becomes absolutely effective. And so as God calls us, the Spirit is working secretly in our hearts to regenerate us. And we then most gladly respond to the Father's summons and take hold of Christ as he's offered to us in the gospel. That call includes then the exercise of faith. That's what it leads to, which leads as well to this living union with the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about throughout this eighth chapter. All of this is at work here. We don't want to forget the things that Paul has said. And the first objective reality then of this call with the exercise of faith is going to be our justification. Now, the justification is absolutely necessary if we're going to be 
conformed perfectly to the image of Christ that he might be the firstborn. Because a guilty criminal cannot be conformed, cannot come into union or fellowship with Christ. So we know that in our justification, God does two things for us. He's pardoned all of our sins, past, present, and future. More importantly, he constitutes us legally righteous. Doesn't just commute the sentence. No, he pardons the criminal by having satisfied his justice in Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. These are the two great things that God's doing. In them, we can relate the whole process of the application of redemption. But you see, it cannot fail. The calling is effectual. Justification then cannot be lost. It brings us to the final product. So that God has eternally purposed to conform us to the image of his son. We're actually going to come back now to the eternal purpose. For then the last part of the chain is that those whom he justified, he did what? He glorified. Now, you might say, where's sanctification? Well, here, sanctification is implied. You'll not be glorified if the process of conformity is not going on in your life, that which we call sanctification. And so you can't have glorification without sanctification. But the reason he jumps out of glorification is to show us the certainty of the reality of the promise and gives us a beautiful picture of what our glorification is. What is it? <coughs> Perfect conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is to be glorified. Body and soul, perfectly conformed, so that we love God sinlessly. Our wills are sinless. Our desires are sinless. Our work is sinless. Never perfect. Not perfect in a finite way, but always able to grow in these things as finite creatures and to have our capacity for loving God to increase uh, eternity after eternity. But you see, this is, this is what God's doing. And you see, you can't lose your salvation. No, it's God's eternal purpose to conform you perfectly to the image of His Son through this work of redemption. All of these words are in the past tense. Those whom he justified, Paul wrote this a couple thousand years ago, he glorified. Why is it in the past tense? It cannot fail. It's God's eternal purpose. This should anchor you in your assurance of salvation. This is God's work. It's not your work. If it was your work or my work, it surely would fail. I remember when I explained to my mother that I had become a Christian. She says, well, it'll be like everything else you've done. You'll never complete it. Now, from the world's point of view, that's exactly right. I, I've dabbled in all kinds of things by the time I was 13 years old. Uh, but you see, I didn't start it. And I didn't do it. And so 60 years later, God who begun a good work in me is bringing it to completion. And that's our comfort and our assurance. But it's also our comfort then in, in the struggles of our lives. It's all according to this master plan of a loving father who has the most wonderful purpose in all, and that is to conform us perfectly to the image of his son forever through this great work of redemption. Now, if this is God's purpose then in our Christian living, what should our purpose be? That the Son be glorified in us. That by God's grace, we reflect Him now in our thoughts, in our speech, in our actions. That we would plead with God to make us uh, more conformed now to the image of the Son. The people now would see the Son in us that now the Son would be glorified in our lives, that our purpose will be right in line with God's purpose. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for parting the veil, showing us here what it is that you're about in redemption, but in our lives personally. We pray for a great comfort, Lord, for your people. 
and that we will delight in you and in your plan, which means that we can rejoice in all things. And we pray, Lord, you will work out in our lives all things as you have promised. Under the end, not only that we will anticipate glory, but you will prepare us for glory. For Christ's sake, amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.